The Shaping Opinion podcast is brought to you by O'Brien Communications, an independent corporate communications firm. O'Brien Communications helps clients of all sizes with corporate communications and strategic planning, marketing communications, public relations and media relations, content development and writing, and crisis and issues management. Learn more at O'BrienCommunications.com. When you wrote this book about Abraham Lincoln, was there any point in the research or the writing process where you felt like you actually met the man or you knew the man? What happened during the writing process was that I felt, as, as, I, may, as I conducted more and more research, that I was able to move from the mythical Abe Lincoln into the flesh and blood Lincoln. And, and I discovered things about him that I had never known. For example, he stood up Mary Todd at the altar the first time they were supposed to get married. They had a big wedding plan. He just never showed up. It was a year later before they married. The fact that he used to ride the judicial circuit uh, and sleep two men in a bed or more at times and live off the land as they went from town. I knew I didn't know any of this stuff about Lincoln. I knew the Lincoln I would look up to at the Lincoln Memorial, and I'd read those words, and I'd think about what he did during the Civil War. But this was a much more flesh and blood Abe Lincoln. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion podcast, we're joined by David Fisher. He's a best-selling writer who worked with Dan Abrams on their latest book, Lincoln's Last Trial, the murder case that propelled him to the presidency. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today, we're going to talk with David about a scandalous trial by any standard. This one helped change history. It set attorney Abraham Lincoln up to become the 16th president of the United States. Dan Abrams is the CEO of Abrams Media and the chief legal affairs anchor for ABC News. David Fisher is the author of more than 20 New York Times bestsellers. The two worked together to write Lincoln's Last Trial, the murder case that propelled him to the presidency. David and Dan drew from the transcript of a case reported to have changed everything for an attorney from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln. David will tell us how they drew from a transcript of the case. The case is called The State of Illinois versus Peachy Quinn Harrison. The transcript was discovered in 1989 in a garage that once belonged to Peachy Harrison's great-grandson. In this conversation, we talk about Abraham Lincoln's skills as a litigator and how they prepared him for life as President of the United States. David, you've written 20 New York Times bestsellers. How did you do that so consistently? Well, 20 New York Times bestsellers sounds like a lot, but I've written about 80, more than 80 books. So <laughs> I like that I've written more than 60 books that were not New York Times bestsellers. I've been able to write about pretty much, I mean, almost any subject that anyone could name. I've written about cars and I've written about rockets and pets. I've written about crime, killing. I've written about baseball and music. Uh, I've written extensively about the law. Uh, I've had a wonderful career as a writer because it's enabled me to dip my foot into so many different worlds. And you just never know what's going to work and what's not going to work. And it's always it's always a thrill when something uh, you've worked on shows up on the Times list. Because it means you've, you know, when I when I started my career many years ago, every time I had a book come out, I would go into a bookstore and, and look around and I would think it would literally be impossible for every book in this store to be better than mine. And some of that never goes away. So the feeling of, of seeing your book on that list is is about as big a satisfaction as a, as a writer can get. <laughs> 
Now, you and Dan Abrams worked on this book about Lincoln. How did you end up pairing up with Dan Abrams, and how did you find this topic to write about? Well, I was working on a book about the Civil War. As sometimes happens, I would see one line or two lines that would totally catch my attention. And I just saw in my research that there was a transcript of a trial that Lincoln uh, of a murder trial that Lincoln had been the defense attorney. And not only that, he had been the defense attorney in 27 murder trials. And I didn't know nothing about this. And I was fascinated by it. And I went ahead and did my research and I got a hold of the transcript. And it was wonderful. And as I was reading it, I'm thinking, these are Lincoln's own words. Uh, I had lunch with uh, uh, a uh, an editor I'd worked with several times named Peter Joseph, who had just been given his own imprint, which eventually became Hanover Square Press at Harlequin. And as the, as Harlequin, the romance company, was trying to get into uh, a, a wider world. And he loved the idea. And we both, the for, for any listeners who don't know this, the key word in publishing today is platform. What's your platform? Meaning, how can you reach potential readers? And, well, I've had success. Uh, I don't have that kind of name. Well, I could probably have gotten on some TV shows. I certainly couldn't have gotten greater uh, access. And, and I was talking to a friend of mine, thinking, who, who would be the best person to pair with on something like this? And he suggested Dan Abrams. Dan being ABC's literary, uh, legal affairs correspondent, uh, as well as hosting... Uh, several shows, one of which was my son's favorite show, Live PD, and I thought, boy, that would be great. And I reached out to him, and we had lunch, and I explained it to him, and he listened, and he was interested, and we began talking more, and he got, he said, okay, let's do it. And, and uh, well, I've worked with many different collaborators. I've worked with very few people who have thrown themselves into the process with as much excitement and zeal as Dan has, and also really had significant imprint, uh, input rather, in, in the final process. It was Dan, for example, who suggested the point of view that we eventually took, which was somewhat unique. It was Dan who really figured out what the important legal points were. And Dan, at one point, we went a little beyond well, we went outside the the courtroom more than, in fact, was necessary. And it was Dan, and, and we argued about this. And it was Dan who sort of prevailed that we needed to cut down. And, and in retrospect, he was completely right. So, you know, what we were trying to do was set up some sort of model for books that will come after this. And we were already at work on the next one. And that's how Dan and I teamed up on this. And it's a terrific team. I'm, I couldn't be more pleased to be his partner. What was unique about that point of view that he brought to it? The book is told through the eyes of a man named Robert Roberts Height, H-I-T-T, who was one of the very first transcribers or stenographers, steno men. Well, he's pretty much forgotten in history. Robert Height was hired by the Chicago Press, which became the Chicago Press and Tribune, to transcribe the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And it was Height's transcription of the debates that made Lincoln a national figure. And there's always been an historical debate about whether he cleaned up Lincoln's words and didn't do the same with Douglas, but they became friends, Height and Lincoln. And Lincoln urged the family of the accused to hire him to transcribe this trial. In case he lost the case, they would have a reason to appeal. So Dan said, you know, it would be really interesting to tell the story through an observer like that. And so it enables us to get far more than just the trial and Lincoln. It enables us to get into the whole history of the courtroom and the history of transcribing, uh, transcribers, court reporters, and what was going on in the greater 
country at the time. And to talk about Lincoln as a character as opposed to making Lincoln the character. It just provided all kinds of valuable insight that allowed us to go far out outside uh, the realm. And it was terrific. And, it, you know, it really works well. Height, by the way, went on to become a 12-term U.S. congressman and the assistant to the president of the United States. He was successful in his own right. Uh, you mention in your book that Height was actually one of Lincoln's favorite stenographers on multiple trials, wasn't he? Well, not multiple trials, but a few trials. Because after this trial, uh, this was one of, this, I think Lincoln had a couple more trials after this, but this was his last criminal trial, and then he became president. So, And, and Height, as I say, was the transcriber of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but I believe this was the first Lincoln trial that he transcribed. And the manuscript was handwritten manuscript was put away and was found in a shoebox in 1989 in a garage by one of the descend one of Height's descendants I'm sorry one of the accused descendants and was given to the Illinois Historical Society and that's where uh, and they worked with me in in making this happen Now we get into Abraham Lincoln the attorney a lot of people hear about Abraham Lincoln the president but and they know he was an attorney. But can you tell us a little bit more about Abraham Lincoln as an attorney? What kinds of cases did he typically take on? Well, the system, the American legal system, as we talk about in the book, was really in a not quite embryonic, but certainly developmental stage. And the law was being brought to places where there was no law before. So Lincoln and a group of other lawyers and judges would get in there on their horse and get on their buggies and go to a town and they would stay in the town for a week and they would set up court and people would come and hire them to to represent whatever kind of case they had uh, and then they would move on to the next town that was called riding the circuit and they did it twice a year for up to 12 weeks at a time Lincoln learned the law that way. There was no, there were no law schools at that point. You learned the law by studying the law in a lawyer's office, as that, which is how Lincoln learned it. And then you went in front of a panel of men, and they talked to you about the law. And if they thought you knew enough, you became a lawyer, a licensed lawyer. Lincoln handled every type of case imaginable. He represented both slave owners and freed slaves. He did big, big economic cases. He became a major lawyer for the Chicago railroads. As I say, 27 murder trials. We tell some wonderful stories in the book about Lincoln as a lawyer. There was a woman, an older woman, who was abused by her husband, who had beaten her up, and in response, she killed him. And uh, by hitting him with with a cast iron pot, literally killing him. And Lincoln was hired to defend her, and he went into a room with her, and they stayed in the room for about an hour. And um, uh, when they went in the room, they found that Lincoln was there alone, and the woman was gone. And Lincoln said he didn't know what happened, but he he thought she might have had a, a relatives in another state that she went to visit. And I mean, so he would do things like that. His great case, his great economic case, which is. He literally did um, uh, negligence. I mean, he did negligence cases. He did one of the the first trip and fall cases. Somebody tripped on the wooden sidewalk in Springfield and sued the city, and Lincoln was her attorney in in that case. A major case was about a uh, a steamboat that crashed into the pilings of a brand new bridge. And it was a new boat, and it burst into flames and was destroyed. And at that point, it was not decided law who owned the the air rights over a river. So the steamboat owners sued the bridge company, claiming that they had erected a hazard over the river and were responsible for the crash. And what that really was, was an economic case about whether who would own the trade rights. 
at that point, most trade was done on the river. Most shipping was done on the river. If people were allowed to build bridges over rivers, much of that trade would be lost to carriages uh, and wagons. And so it was a major case, and Lincoln, Lincoln literally uh, learned how to pilot a steamboat. He learned all about the tides. He learned everything there was to know because he wanted to prove it was pilot era. And eventually, in the case, there was a hung jury, and it was never retried as people came to believe that we needed bridges over rivers. But that's still a major case about navigation rights. Those are the kind of cases he did. You name a, I mean, there was no such thing as specialty law at that point. Lawyers did everything, and that was Lincoln. You mentioned that he learned how to pilot a boat on the river, and that points us to another area of Lincoln that's kind of interesting, and it actually makes us wonder what kinds of things helped him when he eventually became president. Uh, He was obviously willing to get in and learn new things and master all of the information to become a good lawyer. But in your book, you also describe him as someone who was not afraid to use his personal touch when addressing a jury to be more persuasive. He was a big storyteller. At the same time, he would fall back on rhetoric and be very intellectual. How would you describe the skills he used as a litigator that would eventually help him as president? Lincoln's contemporaries would say about him that while he was a pretty good courtroom lawyer, he really was not an expert on the law itself, but that there was no one better at facing a jury than Abe Lincoln. His summations, his final arguments, which in those days could go on for hours and hours and hours, were as much emotional appeals as anything else, maybe even more so. In this case, for example, Lincoln literally held up the jacket, the bloody jacket of the victim and talked about who he was. It's important, Lincoln knew everybody in the case, in this case. The person who was killed had been an apprentice in his office at one point. The person he defended was the son of his strongest supporter and the grandson of his biggest enemy, political enemy. So he had so much of a personal involvement and he, when facing a jury, he was able to bring all of this into this and and humanize what otherwise could be a very difficult situation for people to to deal with. I mean, he the, he was able to talk about the human effect on everybody's life. He was able to get juries to trust him. You know, that's the honest Abe moniker. That, they, they, that's where that, that came from. It was the idea that, you know, he was so believable. So when he became president, he was able to, to draw on all of that experience on being able to manipulate feelings and opinions and things like that. And, you, you know, I, I tell you, there's something that occurred to me while I was working on the book that I found fascinating. Certainly, uh, apropos today, In Lincoln's entire life, the only command he had ever had was in the Black Hawk War when he had a platoon of about 12 men. That was it. He had never run a company. He had never been a boss. He had never been a leader of a great number. Suddenly, he was the president of the United States. So he had no experience in in real leadership to draw on, and all he could use was the power of his words, and we saw how effective he was. The dynamics you mentioned in Springfield, Illinois, at the time of this trial, illustrates some things just really about what happens in small-town America, especially at that time. I'm going to recap some of the facts of the case as you describe in your book. The first thing is, The trial happened in 1859, and it captivated Springfield, Illinois. This was only nine months before the Republican Convention. 
Political insiders were already watching him on the heels of those Lincoln-Douglas debates. And you wrote that this was a this trial was an audition for some, but it was a second look for others. And in either case, you said Lincoln had far more to lose than to gain. What did you mean by that? Well, when somebody new comes along, when somebody bursts onto the scene, and it wasn't just Springfield. It was, you know, you have to remember Chicago in many ways was the most important city in America. Because on the East Coast, you had New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, all major port, Boston, all major port, port cities. But they tended to move together. They tended to uh, lessen the, the impact that any one of them had. Philadelphia certainly, until the Erie Canal was built, was far more important than New York. But Chicago, Chicago was the gateway to America even though that's what they called St. Louis. It really was Chicago, because that's where the Erie Canal ended up. You know, it, it was as sophisticated as any East Coast city. And the Chicago papers covered this trial, as did some of the New York papers, by the way. But Chicago uh, uh, covered it in, in, in a big way. And the Republican convention in 1860 was being held in Chicago. And Lincoln was the new face. Uh, William Seward was supposed to be the nominee, and Salmon Chase of Ohio was going to be his most formidable opponent. Lincoln had, he, and he had tried cases in Chicago, many cases in Chicago, but had he lost this case at this, just at this perfect time, it would have very much lessened the, uh, the interest in him. He would have been seen as, you know, another lawyer. But so he... he Winning the case was not nearly as important as not losing the case for him when he went into it. And the case itself was something uh, interesting. It involved two men, as you mentioned, from local families in Springfield who scuffled at a local drugstore. It's not something unusual at that time or even today. The people involved were Peachy Quinn Harrison and a gentleman who ended up dying, Greek Crafton with his brother. They were all in, all involved with this scuffle. And as you report it, Peachy Quinn Harrison slashed Greek Crafton with a knife after Crafton and his brother and others, I believe, grabbed Harrison with intent to, and this is a quote, stomp his face over vague insults. Lincoln, we know, effectively defended Harrison after he was indicted by a grand jury for the murder. Lincoln's strategy, as you described it, Peachy Harrison was a frail young man weighing no more than 125 pounds. Crafton was much larger. It was Harrison against at least two at first. Harrison was already taking a beating from the Crafton brothers before he pulled out a hunting knife and started to slash at both of his tormentors. That's with quotes around it. Lincoln's legal strategy was to argue self-defense, not murder. And then in the trial, Lincoln introduced his own personal relationship with the Harrison family. Can you describe how he did that effectively? Today, that would almost be unheard of, that the that the attorney would give the background on how he has this personal relationship with the defendant's family. But not only did Lincoln do that, but it seemed to help his case. Again, what's important to remember in, in those days is that in towns like Springfield and in profession, professions like the law, everybody knew each other. Well... The prosecutor, John Palmer, was Lincoln's opponent in this case. In other cases, he would have been his co-counsel. The judge was someone who also knew all of the people involved. And one reason I love the story so much is every one of these people had a passion and a love for the law and a respect for it. And it's hard to imagine today the way the law has expanded and and each of our lives and all of the things that go on. But upholding the law and the respect for the law in that point was paramount. So when when you got all of these people involved, it didn't really matter what side they were on. What mattered is upholding the law and in many cases making law. It's impossible to read this book and not think of the Trayvon Martin case. A hundred years later, more than a hundred years later, 150 years later, because the concept is exactly the same. Stand your ground, the right to defend your life, 
And in the book, Dan and I, in, at some length, by the way, go into a real, the real history of self-defense, what it is and, and, and how it has been transformed as a defense through the years. You know, we go back to John Adams defending the British soldiers at the Boston Massacre using that same basis. And I was really surprised to discover that how limited the rights of self-defense had been historically. You, would, in British law, you literally had to have your back against the wall before you were allowed to legally fight back. And so we get into all of those kind of things, that, that whole, the whole aspect of it. You know, and we see the characters involved, the, many of them, several of them became ranking officers during the war, during the Civil War. On both sides of this case, they became uh, ranking officers in the Union Army. Lincoln depended on these people and liked them and respected them. David, there was one thing that this entire case turned on, and it was something that is a little bit fuzzy, and it was a, it was a deathbed admission. Now, we know that Crafton was mortally wounded in the abdomen, and he died three days after the fight. But apparently, Lincoln's case was built on the statement, really, by a man by the name of Peter Cartwright that Greek Crafton forgave Peachy for his actions in the fight. Can you talk about this turning point in the trial or this determining point in the trial? This is another one of those incredible aspects of, the, of this trial. Peter Cartwright, at this point in America, was far better known than Abraham Lincoln. He was one of the two or three leading evangelicals in the country. He had a huge following. He had just written a big best-selling book. He was the Billy Graham of his day. And as I say, far better known than Lincoln. He also was Lincoln's foremost political opponent. He had run against Lincoln for Congress twice, winning one and losing one. And after losing, he came out and he made statements about Lincoln that he despised him. He called Lincoln a heathen. But Peter Cartwright was also Peachy Quinn Harrison's grandfather, and he was an extraordinarily well-respected man. So when Greek Crafton was on his deathbed, who would come to his side but the leading religious leader of the time, who was Peter Cartwright? And it put Lincoln in the incredibly difficult position, and Cartwright too, of Lincoln having to deal with Cartwright on the stand and Cartwright being his best witness. And Cartwright claimed, although other people claimed this was not true, that Greek Crafton had said to him in his, when he knew, after he knew he was dying, that he didn't blame Peachy because he had brought it on himself. Now we also, we go into the law of deathbed confessions and, and all of those things that surround that in describing what happened. But it's, a, it's an amazing turn. It's one of those things that in a, in a movie, it would be hard to believe, but it happened. And Peter Cartwright and Lincoln, while they were never friends, they certainly were no longer enemies after the trial. As you researched this book and you came across that piece of information, did you find any corroborating proof that Greek actually said that on his deathbed? Well, I, I mean, this is what Peter Cartwright testified to. You know, the question is, if Billy Graham were to testify in a trial and raise his right hand and swear to God that he was telling the truth, there's a substantial chance jurors would believe him. And so all we have is Peter Cartwright's testimony that this happened. You know, I mean, no one was there. Well, there was other people who also spoke to Greek on his deathbed, and they said he said no such thing, but they were not in the room. You know, it really comes down to whose word does the jury believe? And that leads us to another question that starts to set us up for the presidential campaign, and that is obviously they believed Peter Cartwright, but it also speaks to the convincing qualities and credibility of Abraham Lincoln. You wonder if another attorney might have presented the same case if they might have believed him or not. Well, it was an extremely controversial case. In fact, the killing actually took place in what was known as Short's Drug Store, Mr. Short. And Mr. Short tried to stop the fight and testified at the trial. But 
the decision was so controversial that following this trial, Short himself was indicted for aiding and abetting P.G. Quinn. Now, eventually that was thrown out and never went to trial. But in Springfield, it was a highly, highly controversial trial. And there were a lot of people who felt that Lincoln had sort of bedeviled the jury and convinced them to reach the verdict they shouldn't have reached. How do you think this trial affected the 1860 run for president for Abraham Lincoln? Well, I can tell you, I mean, uh, significantly. Uh, Let me put it another way. I think this trial had a significant bearing on the 1860 election because one of the attorneys on the other side, on the prosecution side, was a man named Norman Broadwell. This was the group of men on both sides who had essentially founded the Republican Party. Because of that, the Republican Convention of 1860 was held in Chicago. Norman Broadwell of Springfield, Illinois, was uh, given the job to arrange the seating. Who would sit where? And Norman Broadwell claimed for the rest of his life that he had manipulated the situation to get Lincoln the nomination. And what he did was he put all of the, and I can tell you, I found this in a book that no one has ever read. It was published in 1904, written by Norman Broadwell's daughter. He arranged the seating in such a way that the supporters of Seward, who everyone expected to get the nomination, had all of the seats in the front. Behind them, he seated Lincoln's supporters, and in the back, he seated the supporters of Salmon Chase of Ohio and other potential candidates. After the first ballot, when Seward failed to get enough support, the Lincoln people simply turned around and started negotiating with the Chase people and the Seward, they they wouldn't let the Seward people get through to talk to them. So the deals were made that got Lincoln the nomination. And I I think that clearly goes back to this trial and and the relationships that Lincoln and, and this legal community had. So it wasn't just the performance in the courtroom, but it was all of those things, like you mentioned, the relationships that were formed over the course of the trial itself. Absolutely. We see what, and, and in the war, people like John Palmer, who was the prosecutor and Lincoln's opponent, Lincoln made him a, 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 eventually a general in the Union Army and a good general. These were people, all of whom went on to fight in the war, in many cases, distinguished careers. After all of the time you've had to think about Abraham Lincoln in the course of writing this book, can you tell me if you think someone like Abraham Lincoln could run for president effectively in today's political climate? I think that being in a position to run for president in many, many cases is a matter of luck. It's, you know, it's like being a major league baseball player. You may have the skills, but you get caught in the minor leagues or you get injured or something. So to get through to that point, even where you're considered, is, requires a lot of skill, but also a lot of luck. The values that... Lincoln possessed, which we need so badly today, if he had been able to communicate, and who knows, using our technology and our media, he would have been an incredible candidate. But, you know, he he did have, his voice could get a little whiny, apparently. He was certainly not a photogenic man, you know, but... There was a quality of character there that were he able to communicate that to the camera, the answer is absolutely he would have made a tremendous candidate and president. David Fisher, thank you for joining us today. Well, Tim, thank you for having me. It was a a real pleasure. Make sure to check out our show notes for more information on everything that we talked about today. You'll find a bio on our guest, David Fisher, and you'll find more information on the book he authored with Dan Abrams, 
Lincoln's Last Trial, the murder case that propelled him to the presidency. You can also listen to other episodes. And don't miss our next episode. You can subscribe to the Shaping Opinion podcast in many ways, and they're all free and easy to find at your favorite podcast channel and at shapingopinion.com. This is where we talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien. Thank you.